Would you like to support Cubs Out Loud? One way is to join us over on Patreon. For as little as a buck a month, patrons get early access to our shows, the pre and post show, and various other rewards. You can learn more at patreon.com slash Cubs Out Loud. Thanks to all of our patrons for their support in making this podcast. It's Sunday, April 23rd, 2023. I'm Jeff. Who's your bear? That's right. I am your bear. I'm Damon. I don't brew the tea. I just serve it. And that makes me Gary. Everyone else is thinking it, and I just say it. Welcome to Comes Out Loud, the bear podcast. It's been determined length where Jeff doesn't share the audio. But in any case, we do have a Dr. Edward Angelini Cook with us. Yay! 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 It's one of those shows. Oh my goodness. Uh, I'm sorry, I went a little off script. <laughs> okay. okay, Dad. What the hell are we talking about? Oh. <laughs> it was good to have a laugh in the pre at the end of the pre-show um so you didn't see uh, everybody they were on their cameras going <laughs> <laughs> we're all trying to motion to tell jeff we can't hear the audio so we have no idea what the hell's going on <laughs> like we don't know if the theme's playing or not anyways it was good it was fun so yes applause for dr edward angelini cook because you're gonna have applause pretty soon uh, for those of you that are patrons and caught the pre-show, uh, Edward, you're traveling soon, and you're going to be uh, making a presentation and discussing part of what we're covering today. Yes. So, uh, have you prepared a script? And if so, have you practiced it? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> Just keep giving me the puns so I can use them in the in the synopsis. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, anyways, um, Dr. Angelini Cook is back with us because we're discussing landscape of relationships, our ongoing series, where our resident COL sex therapist helps us think about different ways that we can improve ourselves and our relationships with others. So, um, I got to admit. This is one I am totally not familiar with, but I'm sure I will understand it by the time we're done. So please enlighten us. Well, thanks, Gary. So this um, actually came out of our last uh, topic on sexual desire. Mm -hmm. um, because we were talking about a lot of times our sexual desires usually follow a, a script that we have written for ourselves, like a story that's in our head. Um, mm. And so we're going to be talking about sexual scripts today, um, which was a, I guess, an, a vital part of my dissertation um, results uh, that a lot of the uh, the ways in which so we manage uh, pain um, and and seek help from that follows a or can follow a specific script um, and uh, so yeah so when when we're talking about um, sexual scripts right it is very much like you know what what it sounds like it's very much a metaphor for the you know like a script that an actor would have um, and that, you know, a script is usually a set of, you know, words that uh, the actor follows in order to get through a scene. Well, very much like, uh, like, a you know, an acting script, a sexual script are the, um, are the, the symbols, the, um, the stories, the narratives that we are telling ourselves that are uh, the, about how a sexual encounter um, is supposed to go um, or should go. And um, a lot of these scripts are culturally and societally approved. 
um, that a person or, you know, an actor can have, can access. Um, it's something that they agree upon and it's something that they also activate through a, a sexual socialization process. Um, so it's also important to know that um, sexual scripts are specific to the culture that a person is socialized in. So like, you know, like we know, like, um, you know, age of um, age of consent is going to be different depending on where you're at. Um, expectations for like gender expectations are going to be different. Um, like, you know, uh, the ways in which that we interact sexually are going to be different based on where we are. Um, and all of these, uh, these, these scripts, these stories tell us how to behave, what to think, uh, what emotions that we are having, um, and what's not acceptable. Um, and that, excuse me, <laughs> sorry, um, and that we carry these scripts with us into sexual situations, and they help us, um, they help tell us how to respond to um, specific stimuli. Um, so there are two theorists, um, William Simon and John H. Gagnon. Um, and in 1986, they were the ones who basically theorized this. Um, and through their, their research, they identified that sexual scripts have three um, different categories, um, meaning they are, they can be like social, cultural, um, they can be interpersonal, right? But you know, that deal with uh, us as a person and then also with somebody in that space and then intrapsychic uh, between the years. Um, so that's generally what sexual scripts are. Um, do we have any questions on that so far? I'm very curious about intrapsychic. So mm -hmm. that you said it's just a mental, like what we think about ourselves or the scripts we give in our own minds yeah which is which is and can be um influenced um and it, you know uh internalized by the cultural scripts the cultural sexual scripts the interpersonal sexual scripts um and then after time we start to develop uh, you know our own sexual menu or what what we're really mm. interested in um and like we'll find out, sometimes that doesn't follow the scripts, right? Sometimes we have sexual desires. Um, sometimes we're aroused by things that are not, um, that do not follow the social cultural script. Right. Hmm. 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 <laughs> I was just thinking of the first, when you said that, I was like, oh, well, then there, there goes fetishism. Like, like <laughs> that's where fetishes can potentially come from the things that maybe don't always necessarily follow the script potentially exactly like quite literally that is what um what that is and then also you know we're going to talk about um our own experience of sexual desire our own experience of sexual pleasure is an intrapsychic um script that we follow hmm. right um, wow. like have you and we'll, we'll get there, but, um, yeah. you know, it's, I think it's really, really interesting and it has a lot of really cool implications for how we talk about sex. Um, I think that one of the ways that you can look at this is from a top down approach, but I like to always look at things from a bottom up, um, approach, like, you know, like sure. A lot of the things, a lot of our uh, sexual scripts come from up here. Um, but like, what about down here, right? Um, you know, like have some agency. Um, you know, I think when we think about it from the top down, it doesn't give us agency. So let's mm. let's find out where we have control in this situation. That makes sense. Yeah, I think it's interesting Ed, for the perspective about that we have these things called sexual scripts and that we take them with us, like we carry them all the time, and we don't necessarily know that they exist. And then this can help us understand why there may be, um, I guess, discomfort in having experiences with other people because they have their own script. And so, like, Damon shows up and he thinks it's Othello and someone else shows up and they think it's Macbeth. And it's like, okay, well, you're kind of on the same page, but two totally different things. And so, like, that doesn't really jive. Quite literally. Um <laughs> And 
you know, I think when we get into like the interpersonal scripts, that's going to be really interesting because I want to talk about um, like hookup culture um, and how that kind of follows that script. Um, And uh, yeah, I mean, and I think that it's all important. It's all really important to know that we're not going to, we don't all have the same script and that's not necessarily a problem. It's just, we need to be aware of that. Yeah. It's, you know, similar to when we were talking about the sexual desire things, everyone has different desires and needs when they, when it comes to sex. And that would probably mean that from a scripting standpoint, that they would have different, ways to approach those desires they would probably have something set in how they would potentially get what they need and um i think one of the problems that a lot of people encounter is trying to trying to read somebody else's scripts Mm. um and that's not doing it for you Mm. i'm thinking about that ed because i was like well I get it from one perspective. It's like, well, it's not for me to read someone else's script. It's their script. They read their script. And yet I would feel like, but wouldn't reading their script help me be a better partner? But I think it's in the the sense (laughs) of I'm reading somebody else's script, um, but I'm, I'm not, I'm not focusing on my script. Mm, So I'm going to throw my, my actor theater hat on for a second because we're talking about scripting and you just mentioned plays. Um, So when a script comes out, like everything in the script is written. So who is saying what for every actor is on the page. But when you are assigned a role, you should mostly focus on your lines. But there you go. You can also, you do kind of have the hear what's coming before you and after you. And as if you're acting, you know, kind of develop how you're going to respond and how your um, line is spoken. Um, So it's kind of a, a, it's kind of a, yes, you maybe need to know the script of your partner, especially if it's a dialogue, um, your kind of thing, but Mm -hmm. um, you may only need to know the ending words or the beginning words. You know what I mean? Like the beginning of their lines. So you can know when they're supposed to speak and you're not supposed to. Yes. Um, Unless it's like an argument or something along those lines where lines are kind of jumped on top of each other. Um, And then, I mean, again, theatrically speaking, you can go into like, well, there are monologues and those are, (laughs) that's your own script. And you have to determine how you are going to act that script. Um, when you're presenting it to someone for an audition, per se. Well, there's also mm-hmm. improv scripts. Lots of going... Where it's yeah, not we're necessarily definitely... we're, we're... word for word, but this thing happens, then this thing happens, but how you get from A to B, there's still a guiding thing. Mm-hmm. Well, I, that's really interesting because my first thought was, well, isn't that all sex? And then I was like, oh, no, actually, it's not. Because I think far too many people in America um, feel that it's formulaic and it's very predictable. Like, and <laughs> I see you, Ed. <laughs> yes, David. Like, I, I do think that's fact. Like, I, I was just thinking about it. And I was like, yeah, I think that's the issue is that people – they're not aware that it actually is an improv, mm-hmm. that that it is a fluid, dynamic situation, and it does not have to be, as much as we've joked in the past about, like, insert tab A and slot B, it's <laughs> like, you know, it, it's like, yeah, but that's not everything. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. I just saw recently on Twitter, I, I think I shared it, I really appreciated someone was like, you know, oh, like, you're not feeling comfortable, you know, about um topping no big deal we can cuddle and do other things like not you like stomach having tummy problems not really feeling like bottoming no big deal we'll cuddle and we'll do other things like yeah or you're just not really feeling like it like that's okay we can just like you know cuddle and hold hands or whatever like 
And yeah. it, I really loved that the message was like, there are options. And this mm -hmm. is about communicating and letting each other know, like, where are we and, you know, what could happen? Well, that's the podcast, everybody. Thanks for thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Ed. And see, no, but the and, and see, like I was going to say, <laughs> like some so, the, the, some we all remember, like some of the worst porns we ever watched was when the act when the actors were like spitting lines that were so just bland. And with no like substance at all, like it's just like I'm here with your pizza. Oh no, I don't have the money to pay for it. Whatever shall I do? Well, I have yeah no like like that where it just becomes very just like rote almost. <laughs> like yep. there's a the, there's a classic, and again, it's probably not the greatest, but there was a classic um, Saturday Night Live sketch where I think they were breaking down like it was a Siskel and Ebert-esque like breaking down like gay porn and each one of them it was two men in a like different kind of like scenario like pizza boy and um or something like swimming or coach or whatever some kind of scenario and each one of them was like um you look tense you should you should get a massage and then the guy would like take off shirt and then they would massage him. And then it would, that was sort of the whole point of the, like, they weren't clearly showing sex because it was Saturday Night like, Live. But, like, the idea was that was the the moment every time where the porn music would start. And it was just, like, that was sort of, like, the whole, like, point of it. And it was just, like, and each, and the thing I remember the most about it was, like, each scene kind of ended with that, like, you need a massage or I should give you a massage or whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yay. <sighs> yeah, so shall we get into examples? Yeah, so um all right, hold on. So you know how I said that um a lot of sexual scripts are sociocultural, interpersonal, and intrapsychic. So I thought it would be kind of interesting to kind of go through, talk about like the different kinds, um, and possibly uh, throw in examples of our own. So uh, mm -hmm. when it comes to like cultural scripts, right, these are things that come from like up here. Um, dating culture is a uh, like a really good example of um, of that. And we know that like dating culture um, has followed kind of like the same pattern and has been influenced for many, many years. Um, and uh, And if you didn't know, um, a lot of uh, our current dating culture is influenced by um, prostitution. Really? Yes. I, um, I was not expecting prostitution. I was expecting courting. Like, like, you know, betrothment, like, you know, commitment to another person. Uh, oh. In, in the way of, like, you know, coming towards marriage, not sex work. I'm a tree. But, uh, but there was a bridge there, right? So courting, yes. But then there were a lot of when the like industrial revolution happened, there were, um, that's also when sex work was starting to get really um, like mainstream. And when, um, when that was all kind of going on, a lot of like the teenager, kind of culture started adapting, started using a lot of the same um, practices as sex workers. Um, and that got people out of the courting um, culture and into what we see now as dating culture. Mm. There's a so, really great book that I can't remember what it's called right now um, that goes <laughs> over that. So you would take a sex worker out for a soda? Um, sometimes, yeah, like that would be, um, it was kind of that, that process. So similar is to like escorts in a sense, like the whole, like that kind right. of like, I don't want to say higher profile, but the idea behind like you would, 
it wasn't just the sex. It was about the wooing of yeah. you know, getting them getting getting them interested in you enough to where we can then have sex or something along those lines. Yep. Yeah. Because a lot of courting was done in house. Mm-hmm. A lot of modern dating is outside of the house. Yeah. In public. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So um so really interesting. Uh but a lot of the ideas that we have about dating culture are um like those scripts are very culturally identified, right? Um right. Also, like premarital sex, right? Um, that is something that um, is a a script that 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 we have um, culturally um, that a lot of people abide to. Do they? I mean, they. But well, <laughs> <laughs> um. They, they, well, okay. So the other thing that's really important for all of these things, right? Like you may have this expectation, you may have the script that you're supposed to follow. Um, but what if you break it? Yeah. Yeah. Like, like there, that, that can be a breeding ground for guilt and shame. Yep. I get Pretty that. Hard. I'm just kind of poking at the whole, like, you know, that, 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 you said the majority, I think, or like, and I'm like, mm. I'm well, like, I I think that's changed, and I, some, I and for some reason the concept sticks in my mind. The the quote one doth protest too much because I feel mm-hmm. like I feel like a great many people like may say one thing, but I'm like, let's, right. let's talk about the reality though. Like I was just having this yeah. conversation at work recently. I was like, so if it's a, a heterosexual couple and she only performs oral. That's not sex in some, in some con- in concepts. Um, if they have anal, that's not sex because sex is procreation. And I had this discussion with coworkers because yeah. when you're, when you're having this kind of interaction with someone, you have to literally break it down into what do you do with your body with another person's body? Because if you just say sex, some people may culturally or from their background feel that like, well, I didn't put a penis inside a reproductive organ of another person. So that's not sex. And it's like, yes, but you can still have a sexually transmitted infection. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't mm-hmm. I don't care how you want to define it. We're going to talk about the reality of the physical. <laughs> like, so, you know. Yeah, exactly. Was, uh, there's a wonderful, wonderful song, um, and I'm just trying to find it on um, by Garfunkel and Oates. Um, mm-hmm. the, uh, the loophole. Yes, it's called the loophole, mm-hmm. and it's very much about this, like being holy and Christian and not having sex for procreation, but you can. You can fuck me in the ass because I love Jesus. Yeah, that's 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 right. <laughs> that is right, right. right. So that's all. That's mm-hmm. all why I bring that up about the premarital sex thing. I'm like, mm, okay, like it, like I don't. I'm not debating with you, Ed. I'm just saying, like, I understand that like there could be a script about this, and yet I'm like it's antiquated. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, go on with your list because we know what's next. <laughs> um. Well, what's next is monogamy, right? So, like, you know that that is a big one in um, uh, in society, right? That they're and like that they we have seen this like shift um, in general acceptance of non monogamy, but there is still this cultural sexual script that, like, you know, you have. Um, you know, you are in a relationship with one person. Well, and I think that that's the baseline norm that society puts out there. Like, you should have one partner for a lifetime. Like, and it's sort of this kind of strange utopian, like, 
thing to work towards or whatever. And I phrase it that way because I think all Mm -hmm. of us on this podcast have been through the same cultural context that that's the expectation. Mm -hmm. And what bothers me about it is like I do this all the time at work. I find myself sort of pushing back against this is that but that's not for everybody. Not Mm -hmm. everybody ascribes to that. Not everyone continues with that Mm -hmm. in their life. They're on a path. And so I bring up repeatedly, you know, when some people say something, especially people who don't realize they're being judgmental about the number of partners that someone's had. And so like, you know, if someone has to come back, say for retesting, Mm-hmm. And I, you know, and I was asked, do they have to, you know, do we have to do all the questions again? I was like, well, yes and no. And I was like, at least give them the opportunity to update, even if it's only been a couple of days, because mm-hmm. they could have literally had more partners since the last time they were here. Like, hell, they could have had a partner five minutes ago in the parking lot, for all we know. Like, right. They could have. Right. And, and like, so all of us are well aware of that. But you should see the looks of my coworkers' faces. They're like, oh, oh. and I'm like. And there's a part of me that's like, what, what, what do you people not understand? Like 24 hours a day, seven days a week, like for all infinitum, people are having sex. Like, yeah, Mm -hmm. it's not just when the sun is down in a bedroom (laughs) behind a closed door. Like that's, that's not the reality. It's not just on Sunday evening or not Sunday evening. Nope. Not on the Sabbath. (laughs) Nope. No, no, not that. No. (laughs) Like. Friday night anal, like it's it's not it's not <laughs> Friday night anal. <laughs> Only after Friday midnight. Night All right, that's mm-hmm. witching hour. Um, it's always funny to me that that people still have that script of monogamy because it's still there, it's still out there. There's still people that still want to look down upon people who want to have like are are interested in having multiple partners when we've shown time and time again that not everybody is the same and not everybody has those same you know interest and desires not everyone wants a monogamous relationship not everybody can maintain a monogamous relationship so correct and i think people take it to the extreme mm-hmm in the other direction they're like oh well if you're not monogamous then you're just like being a whore and fucking all the time and it's like Mm -hmm. no no like there's plenty of people who are in who are poly and they may be more if you were put it on like sort of a, a scale they might some people might think they're more asexual than anything because like they're you know, relationships are more about like commitment and like what's happening between them and not necessarily like sex, mm-hmm. but they don't necessarily understand that unless right. yeah. their, their minds are open. Huh. To sex. Um, and I also think, you know, on the other side of that, um, you know, this is a cultural kind of conversation, but I think within, um, you know, like, uh, like among gay men, right? There is this um, kind of like opposite <laughs> um, mm. thing where like, you know, non-monogamy, the sexual script is that non-monogamy can be the norm. Um, and that, you know, sometimes, you know, it gets, I have seen people not believing um, when somebody says, no, I'm monogamous. Right. Right, because I think we project ourselves onto others. So yeah. if we're if we're a person who likes to have a, a buffet variety of experiences, we're like, why wouldn't you? Like, this does not make right. sense. Does not compute. Yeah, and it's mm-hmm. also that situation where, depending on how you're encountering the person, it's like, oh, well, why are you on this app if you're monogamous, or why are you in this chat room if you're well, that's dated. Um, <laughs> why are you Why are you here if you're not looking looking around kind of thing? And I'm like, well it's a free country or not. Well, um, it's, I can be here. I can be on this app. I can be on here and be monogamous and be looking for, you know, potentially friends and what have you and encounters of a non-sexual nature. Uh, the thing that always bothered me the most about Growler was people kept saying that it was a sex app. And I'm like, it's not a sex app. It can be considered a sex app, but it is not just a sex app. Yeah, there are people on Growler that I have no intention of having sex with um, right. that are just my friends. Right. R- right. It's a, it's a social app 
Mm -hmm. that has a feature about it that leads that can lead to that but it's not Mm -hmm. the main thing of it like that's not its existence sniffies as a website theoretically is because the concept behind it huh what's that (laughs) sniffies.com yeah (laughs) or is it dot net i don't i have to hold on let me check real quick i guess i'll be educating everybody it's dot com s-n-i-f-f-i-e-s sniffies like you're uh smelling something um which apparently historically it comes from the culture of like people selling like uh apparel or items um that were used or worn but anyways it's turned into this it's a it's a hookup website basically um there is no app it is only a website and you can have a profile and it's basically geolocation finding other people nearby and like you can post some pictures or whatever and you can technically chat but it's mostly just hookup like it's kind of all it does oh interesting (laughs) teaching ed new things to research i so i i will be honest given our conversation earlier i so thought you were kidding (laughs) oh yeah no 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 that, oh, that wow. is one I'm not familiar with. Yeah. Um, so something else like, uh, you know, the idea of dominance and submission, right? So like, mm-hmm. you know, there is a sexual script that you know, men are supposed to be dominant, women are supposed to be submissive, right? And that also extends towards even our community, tops are supposed to be dominant and, and bottoms are supposed to be submissive. Which they're not. Which they're not. Just, not just for the record. There are submissive tops and dominant bottoms. Absolutely. Yes. Perhaps in this podcast. <laughs> um, so. <laughs> podcast um, listeners, Jeff raised his hand at his sound of submissive tops. <laughs> um, and then also, like, you know, we have this whole heteronormativity uh like very Mm. dominant cultural script cultural sexual script um in you know our world um that is really wreaking havoc on um uh our sociopolitical arena right now Mm. yeah um what else what are some what what do you think are some other examples of cultural sexual scripts okay so i thought of one but it's really ugly okay um that people do not have independence of like ownership of their body Mm. and this this is why it gets ugly because i'm thinking about how like, like there's been a, a, some advancements in the past five to ten years, how predominantly forever until maybe recently, the vast majority of people, when someone claims that they were sexually abused and or raped, that they need to prove it, not that they are to be believed from the get-go. Yep. Yeah. I and, keep, I'm like sitting here shaking my head like, yep. Well, and and I think the other thing is, like, is we were kind of relating it back to us, like, we, I think it happens within our own community, within our own, like, grouping, and we don't talk about it much. I think that we adopt these dominant submissive concepts for scripts, and the heteronormativity, as in, like, who who is giving and who is receiving, who's supposed to be dominant, who's be, supposed to be submissive, and, like, the submissiveness loses its ability to have its own voice and to speak up and say, I'm not comfortable with this or I'm not okay with this because we have these um, things I think that come in a different script where there's a fantasy about being dominated Mm -hmm. and like, while that does exist, it gets very murky in the moment if you don't feel comfortable with it or right. it's not clicking for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they don't call it rape culture for nothing. <laughs> right. I, I'm laughing at David. How he's, <laughs> how he's, for those that are listening, David like gestures broadly with his hand like, and there we are. Because <laughs> that is... That... Yep. Woo! So, ooh. Anyway. Yeah. Um... Anything else? Anything else you can think of? 
I also think age is a um, a sexual mm. script. Yeah. Uh, race is a sexual script, or yeah, there I are racial gonna, sexual scripts. Yeah, I was going to say that there are probably racial sexual, like, there's the, we were mentioning dominant submissives, there's this whole concept that um, people of Asian culture are, are naturally or automatically submissive, um, kind of, that kind of idea behind it because of some, again, cultural kind of script that has been created um, in some way. Um, well, I mean, it, like any racial sexual script, I think, is super messy because I agree with you, David, like Asian Asian individuals are submissive and some might say that African-American individuals are dominant. Right. And it's like, no, our, like, they our, can be either. The big one is that all um, African-American men, all black men, have big dicks like that is a cultural script that has been sexual script which mm -hmm. is i can tell you right now is not always true it is is there truth sometimes absolutely we can see it like we see it all the time but is it always true no right and i think it's also a part of you know how we would look at people because I hate to say it, but we all judge the book by its cover, the book being mm -hmm. other people. So we look at a person and we're like, oh, well, he's a big dude. He probably doesn't have a very big penis. And then, you know, you find out that you were wrong. Um, and I have no. Right. <laughs> right. I have a I have a perfect example of someone that. Beautiful dick. Anyway. <laughs> 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 Trust me, Twitter has totally proven this to me recently. I was just like, um, you know, we, we've talked over the years about the whole, you know, oh, here's another like cultural, uh, I don't know which one this falls into, Ed. Uh, grower versus shower. Uh-huh. Um, I'm thinking it's probably cultural as a script. And here's why. Because we think like by looking at at a flaccid individual that automatically is going to be the predictor of what it is when it's erect and that is inaccurate it could like you could maybe be a guideline but like damon was just saying about like racial you know cultural scripts it's like well no like there are plenty of individuals who have you know that you would be very misguided to presume from yeah. the very beginning, like in a flaccid state, what things will look like later. That is very true. Um, mm. Yeah, I would also agree. I think that's, um, I think that would be like a cultural sexual script. Um, uh, masturbation, mm. I think is, is another one. Um, I think that, uh, you know, there is, you know, like there, there are a lot of things that, that, um, you know, where people are like, uh, you know, we can't talk about masturbation. Um, but like, you know, you know that it's happening. Um, well, and what's interesting, Ed, is like, there's a whole culture of baiting together or like participating I don't know how I want to say this, like, because I'm not that familiar with it, but like, I, I know like one term is like baiting bros, like that there's like, you may get together or you may like help stimulate someone else by like sharing content with them or, mm -hmm. um, you know, like, I think that happens a lot in online culture spaces where um, I'm thinking primarily of men that they will masturbate cam to cam or watching each other, which I find interesting because going back to the whole like premarital sex and monogamy thing, I was like, so is this is this part of that whole loophole theory concept that like, like, well, I'm not really having sex with somebody else. So I'm not being like, I'm not breaking my vow of monogamy because I'm not actually having sex with them. I'm just. Uh, yeah. Yes. The answer is yes. <laughs> yes. What? Yes. What, though? Oh no, that 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 is definitely something. It's really funny because you know you you are there is this this uh, script of what is sex versus what is not sex, um, and then when yeah. like that gets thrown out there, it's like well that's not sex, um, but right. then like the the partner is like yes that is sex, and I'm like yeah, but like that is <laughs> like that has never been discussed. 
<laughs> yeah. Right, right. It's like, like well, the- wait, did you go up to someone else's home, walk inside, go to a semi-permanent surface with a hole in it and stick your penis through it and then have someone like suck on your genitalia? That would be sex. But just like watching somebody on a video screen, is that sex? And I get what you mean. It's like, well, that has to be a discussion. Like that has to be defined because I think some people would say absolutely it is because you're having a sexual moment in response to, you know, another person or whatever. And other people would be like, well, no, because like, you're not doing anything with anybody. All right. Right. Um, so, um, so now we're kind of getting, so this is great. Nice. Mm-hmm. Um, natural evolution here. Um, so now we're kind of talking about like interpersonal sexual scripts. Um, we, you know, we, so we've been talking about Growler. We've been talking about like, you know, uh, like social media and um, like flirting and like sexual negotiation, I think is a really good example of like interpersonal sexual scripts. And uh, the thing that I, I think that people don't realize, like I just had a conversation. I, I just had to have a conversation with somebody because they were telling me about um, how they are like flirting or like uh, identifying themselves online. And I was like, I wouldn't want to have sex with you. Like this seems really confusing and really um, mind, like, like that's like a minefield. Mm-hmm. Like oh. I am just seeing a bunch of these, this is what you don't want. This is what you don't want. This is what you don't want. Um, I, there's like no green here. Right. We've all interesting seen files, right? Um, and I always I think people on that all the time, and they're like, "I don't like this, I don't like this, I don't like this," and I'm like, "Okay, I can't work with that. What do you like?" <laughs> right, right. Like it's cute. Like I, I appreciate you. Like I appreciate you essentially negating any conversation we're going to have by giving a negative of me. Like I don't want that. Well, okay, good, because I don't want you. So, well, what I was just thinking is, thank you for knowing yourself so well that you know the things you don't want. Mm-hmm. Good on you. But what, what do doesn't you do? help? <laughs> right. But yeah. yeah right. It's I'm, like moving on. Like to go with the the script thing. Like so many of those things. Like you're talking about what's not on the page. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, you haven't said anything about what's on the page right now. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know what I'm reading. So so far, you've literally given me a blank page. That's cute. Yes. Um, so like, I think that we have these patterns of like flirting and stuff that is um, not helpful. Uh, and uh, you know, the thing that I will tell everybody is to make sure that that there is stuff on the page for people to work mm-hmm. with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and to Gary's point, to know yourself well enough that you know what you do want uh, more than what you don't want. Right. I think we talked about wants and needs in a in a previous LOR. Yes, um, and that also kind of talks about sexual negotiation, right? That has to be part of the the conversation. Um, you have to be able to tell somebody what you want. Um, and to, you know, be able and willing to listen to what the other person is saying, what's on their page, mm-hmm. um, that also has to be a part of it as well. Um, and then that leads into consent. Yeah. Um, you know, like, what's, uh, you know, what am I consenting to? What am I not consenting to? But like we just talked about with rape culture, a lot of um, like instances of sexual assault are because of um, interpersonal sexual scripts. Mm. Yeah. That are influenced by cultural sexual scripts. Right, right. You're saying no, but I know that you mean yes. Right. Because, that porn right, because the media, like the world has told me that that's, what should that's how this is supposed to work this is this yeah. is how it happens this mm-hmm. is the script that we're following right this because... is you flirting you saying no yeah. means yes right 
And a lot of um, women's sexual scripts um, do not provide them the agency in order to, because they, a lot of like, you know, it kind of talks about this in the article that a lot of women's sexual scripts, their pleasure, um, they think is um, predicated on them not being pleased. Mm. <laughs> or their sexual experiences um, are, do not include their pleasure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying. Like, that last yes. part makes more sense to me. Of like, yes. No, but I understand what you mean. Like, you know, it, it's, it's like women, which I'll then segue into perhaps like bottoms or those that are submissive in sex. Like they're just there to receive, not, not to have pleasure, which that is a whole fallacy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But you know what? Actually, we can just reframe this as just actors in general, right? Because sexual assault is not just, um, does not like only happen to women, right? That like, you know, it can really happen to a lot of people, you know, it can happen to, to many different people. Um, mm-hmm. And I don't want to just single out women here. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, it's, yeah, it is That's... really frustrating. Yeah. I can kind of fall into the heteronormative like vibe that we normally the previous heteronormative like scripts we've been given, we automatically think of women as like the immediate, you know, um, victim of sexual assault, but that's not always the case. Correct. Um, and then, you know, we also have like top top versus bottom um, uh, interpersonal sexual scripts. Um, and you know, like, and I think the other thing when it comes to like interpersonal sexual scripts is like sometimes these are written for us, and like um, we already kind of know what's on the page, um, mm-hmm. so there isn't a lot of um, kind of dialogue or negotiating to kind of go into that. Um, so, so that's the thing. But sometimes, you know, um, my role, uh, you know, is does not fit into that uh, typical kind of thing right like we've talked before we've had whole conversations around what asides and how mm-hmm. like that isn't like the top bottom hierarchy categorization whatever you want to call it like labeling doesn't work mm-hmm. um and i agree with you like and plus on top of it like there's a huge amount of presumption like if i have bottom listed in a profile on something People presume, I see you shaking your finger, David, like in agreement that like people just presume that means like that's what I'm focusing on. That's what I want. And like that's right. that's that's the end goal. Absolutely. And I remember and- many years ago, an acquaintance of mine criticized me because they were like, you're a bottom. Why don't you put bottom on your profile? And I was like, what? And they're like, they're like, you don't list that like, you know, but that's what you want. And I'm like. Mm. Is it? And like I, I thought about it for a few years, and then I did end up listing it. But like, it, it was interesting because I felt like it was a criticism that was judging me for like not revealing that about myself. Mm-hmm. Like I was almost denying it. And now yeah. all these years later, I look back on it, and I was like, wow, that was kind of bullying. That was kind of shitty. Because yeah. the reality is, like, it wasn't my main thing so that's why i wasn't listening it like you know and that's why it's now phrased something like you know if it comes to that or blah 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 you know it's like Mm -hmm. like i have started removing top from many of my profiles online Mm -hmm. and the main reason is because i've gotten so tired of any time i sign onto them like people like i want you to fuck me or whatever 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 every almost every single time Mm -hmm. because i'm like i really don't get as interested in fucking anymore and topping anymore. I just don't. Right. And, uh-huh. and we've discussed this before in the past, which is the reason behind it. So um, again, I've started removing it because if that's going to be your only engagement with me, it's because you feel like I'm going to fuck your brains out. Then we're not going to move on because that's not what all I'm about. I'm all right. about. 
Well, and that is an interesting thing. I think that's like a, a cultural sexual script about like this whole back and forth. Because I think we've discussed it several times on the podcast in varying ways over the years about how there's a disconnect between like intimacy and just sex Mm -hmm. and how like some people are seeking sex and that's it. And so that's where that conversation comes from. Their side of it is I want to fill in the blank. Like so it's like either I want to fuck or I want to be fucked. Like I either want to give a nut or get a nut. And like that's it there's no like real like anything beyond that so there's not an intimacy there's not an emotional connection it's not demi like there's there's a whole lot of things that there aren't and i think yeah. where the incongruence or the or the kind of disconnect comes in is because when you read that message like you're not in that headspace like that's that's mm-hmm. not where you are you're like you're like uh could you take a girl out first no i mean <laughs> um, but i mean like you're you're in a whole different area you're kind of like you're not in like bathhouse mode i guess is a different way to phrase it like you know you're just like uh no <laughs> swipe block yeah. whatever i agree with destin in our chat so many times people just don't read profiles They're asking if you're a top or bottom when they just need to read it yeah also that like oh oh also so that. true so true. So it's like the opposite where we're kind of like talking top versus bottom. There's also an opposite of it where like you make an assumption based on like presence. Mm. Mm-hmm. And I think that's one of my biggest pet peeves. Like I see this on online quite a bit on a certain website that I frequently use that people ask questions. And I'm like, you know, if you would just read, if you would just scroll down a little bit and you would read, you would clearly have the answer to the thing. But like, you know. What is reading? That's right. It's fundamental. fundamental. And apparently you failed it because yeah. it's too much effort or maybe you actually can't read. And that's unfortunate for the sake of our society. Like, you don't have to ask the question. The answer is already there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because one of yep. the biggest ones I get all the time is, are you a partner? Yeah. It's right there. Usually like the second sentence or the first word or <laughs> it's in the like parts of like the you know, the little things you can click, like the itty, like the things you can always like click, the choices you can click. Like, right. it's all there, honey. And I, I say it multiple times because there's a reason why. Because I always get that, like, surprise moment when someone, when I say my partner or say fiance or whatever word I use, and they're like, really? I'm like, yeah, because it's right there. It's been in my profile since the beginning. Right. Clearly, mm-hmm. you didn't pay attention. <laughs> That's why I'm laughing, because a part of me is like, <laughs> we all have to, are aware of Jim, and we're just like, uh, hello, yes. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <sighs> um. So, uh, what do we got? Oh, yeah, so, like, um, any other kind of interpersonal sexual scripts you can kind of think of? Um, friends with Benefits. Oh, that's a really good one. Because I think that is a general term that can have many definitions. Mm -hmm. And people don't necessarily know or understand that. Not only that there are many definitions, but what those definitions could be. Because I know people who have sexual activities with their friends. And their friends are like family like we talk within our within our community about chosen family and that's what i'm referring to is like like they are really close and they also happen to have sex with each other but they are not in a relationship with each other like not right. a romantic relationship not a marriage not a cohabitation like so and that and i think people might i mean they really bring forward their own script i guess and thinking of what the definition of what like friends with benefits might be because they might think that they're just like people who occasionally hang out and it's like you know oh we're gonna watch the game and suck each other's dicks um you know or (laughs) just as an example yeah it's like what's the difference between friends with benefits and fuck buddies there is a distinction yeah Mm. yeah yeah. yeah. I remember when I worked at, at a I've been gone for a long time now. Uh I was about to like how do I say it? I'm like, I'm just gonna say it. I worked at a clothing optional uh campground resort and there was a couple of guys 
that were very good friends that traveled together and came to the to the establishment. And everybody thought they were a couple because the vast majority of the guests were MSM self-identified as gay. Mm -hmm. These two individuals were much more heteronormative. And yet they traveled together and had sex all weekend long. First couple of times, it was only the two of them having sex with each other. And then over the years, like they just had sex with, with whoever they wanted to have sex with. Um, but I remember a lot of like conversation and confusion because it's like, well, wait, like, aren't they a couple? And when you would talk to them, they're like, no, we're not a couple. We're just friends. And then yep. some people would be like friends who suck each other's dick and fuck each other in the ass. Like, like they like people just <laughs> Had yeah. this like contextual problem because they were just so used to like if friends travel together they don't fuck together like they're just friends like it was such an interesting experience looking back on it now and I think about it because every once in a blue moon someone knows them and will mention them to me and be like you remember so and so and so and so and I'll be like yeah you know and how like that was a thing but now all these years later I look back and I'm like yeah they were just more than likely probably consider themselves fuck buddies but that's mm. not for me to decide the definition for them or the term but anyways mm -hmm. if you get together um, with that with a person primarily to have sex that's a fuck buddy friends with benefits means you get together because you want to hang out and maybe have a sex along the way We're all looking at Ed. <laughs> oh, no, I um I I would agree with that. Yeah. Cool. Um so let's talk about some intra psychic uh sexual scripts. So like we we've talked about these a lot, but like the ideas of like fantasy, kinks and fetishes are um are intra psychic. Like there are things that are um unique to you and your experience as mm -hmm. a sexual being. Um, pleasure, right? That is something that happens between your ears, right? And within your body. Um, sexual desire, right? That's something that you experience. Um, can you think of anything else that you think would be um, intrapsychic? You've given some really good examples here. And I was trying to like think of one that doesn't fall into one of the other categories. And I was like, not really. Like the, so I, the mind is a very wonderful and vast like thing. And just the, like my first thought was like, just, you know, thinking about like different things that turn you on and like, well, that's kind of like a fantasy, but it all comes, we could just be, we mentioned masturbation in the social concept, um, cultural aspects, but I could also see it being something in here because you are using a script, a fit, uh, something in your own mind to pleasure yourself. Yeah, that's a good one too. I have one, but I don't know what to, what it should be titled or named. And it's the intellectual stimulation. Like sapiosexuality? Probably. Like that you, that the person turns you on because of, how they present themselves and speak and have a conversation, perhaps their knowledge, their, their, you know, uh, smarts, if you will, like they, that, that turns you on because you see them as a person who was learned or worldly mm. or experienced. So I would put that in the same, uh, man, what word do I want to use for this? <laughs> All right, I'm going to talk and you're going to give me a word. Um, so, like, there's that, but, like, also, um, you know, uh, we are bears, right? Like, we, we um, typically, um, possibly, like, other bears, right? Um, so, like, our sexual interests um, are, man... <laughs> I can't think of the word, right? It's, um, that is unique, right? That is something that is, um, mm -hmm. that, 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 that is very unique to us. Right. It's something that turns you 
right on, on in a yeah sense. the turn on yeah yeah, yeah. Turn-ons. I was going to say turn odds because I was just thinking about like how friends of mine um, who are, are self-identified as lesbian for some of them, a femme presenting, you know, uh, lesbian is a turn on for them. For others, it's a butch. It's mm-hmm. it's it's a woman who is a lesbian, but is like more masculine and authoritative um, mm-hmm. and, you know, comes across that way that that's a turn on to them. Um, yes. I remember back in the 90s how many people were turned on by Katie Lang, um, you know, and, and that was this big thing because it was like, well, is, is Katie Lang a butch? And then she had this moment where she came out with an album and like dressed up and was all girly with a big dress and makeup and people got very confused. Anyways, it's another topic, but <laughs> like, I think, you know, that that's another aspect of it. So I agree. I do think turn ons is. A, probably a, a good broad based way to say that because like the bear community in some ways I pause because I, I don't think it's tr- as true today. It's origins were in hyper masculinity. It was right. about like looking butch or masculine or macho, whatever you want to phrase that. And like there being a, a like sexiness to that, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. you know, it was, bikers it was denim it was leather you know it was this whole um cultural aspect and and i think <laughs> sorry <laughs> that's okay um and i think we've really moved you know in a different direction from that now mm-hmm. i think that still exists but there's much more to it right um, and now like we have all these other like subcategories or different labels i guess or boxes to check um you know, in terms of uh, aspects with, like, I, I think really now, like, there's a lot of body positivity about curviness and, like, the thickness, quote unquote. Um, you know, for, for a while, there was this whole, like, dad bod rage, which I feel like our community was kind of like, where the hell have you people been? Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> like, like we've been, we've been chasing this shit since the 70s. Anyways. You know? <laughs> um gym teachers anyone anyway sorry uh <laughs> so i think all of that falls under falls under turn-ons yeah um yeah no absolutely so um yeah and i think that uh the other thing is uh the the when we are really focused on the cultural sexual scripts and them not lining up with our intrapsychic sexual scripts there is so much room for um, for sexual shame and um, and sexual mm-hmm. guilt to right. um, to enter in. So um, there's a quote from uh, from the the uh, the people who first theorized um, sexual scripts, uh, Simon and Gagnon. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. But they said that in the, the most pragmatic sense, sexual scripts must solve two problems. The first of these is gaining permission from the self to engage in desired forms of sexual behavior. The second problem is that of access to the experiences um, that the desired behavior is is expected to generate. So, like, you know, part of this is, uh, like, from the bottom up, we have to give ourselves permission um, Mm -hmm. to even um, engage in these interpersonally um, and intrapsychically. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I totally agree because I remember I've told this story probably many times on the podcast. When I first came out in 92, I came out as bi and then gay. But then I didn't find, quote unquote, the bear community and come into that until like seven years later in 99. And I struggled for those in between years because I didn't feel like I had a place. Um. I didn't like, I just kind of hadn't quote unquote met my tribe because I was, I was surrounded in an environment mostly of homogeneousness of what being a quote unquote gay man was in the nineties and like what culture was telling us to be. Mm -hmm. And I Mm -hmm. just wasn't accepting of that. I I felt, and this is going to sound very judgmental, but at the time I really was, I was kind of like, I'm not a lemming. 
like to use a horrible like concept, like I'm just not going to follow along like everybody else. Like I'm not going to like slim myself down and wear super tight jeans and like, you know, a pretty, you know, shirt and blah, 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 and work out six days a week, you know, and have a tan. Like I just wasn't going to do all of these things to be a Calvin Klein model. Like it just wasn't happening. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I was like, I want a man with some meat on his bones. I want some like hairiness. Like I want, you know, um, I, wa- I wanted some very specific things and I just wasn't seeing that in the culture. Mm-hmm. And then when I really formally found the bear community in 99, I was kind of like, Oh, okay. Like it, it checked everything. And I was just mm-hmm. like, Oh, you All mean the there are guys like this and they have sex with each other. Okay, great. Yay. Yes, they do. And I get to be a yeah. part of it even better. Yeah. I remember when I was, when I was, <laughs> young and um i would tell my friends who i was interested in they were like ew <laughs> <laughs> uh, right and like, i was like, like what the hell right like isn't it like an interesting like cultural like discordance to be like oh i realized that i like the same gender as me and then to have people within a community be like yeah but you can't like that right and you're right. like no but i I do. I do. Oh, Very much my so. Yum. Yeah. Don't yuck my yum. Yeah, well, you know, when we were 20 years old, we didn't know what that meant. <laughs> no, not at all. Because I think the presumption was, well, everybody likes Tootsie Roll Pops. And you're like, eh. <laughs> you're like, Some of us the like or- Pops. I like the I like the orange ones. <laughs> right. Yeah, but you could take that, um, you could take that grape blow pop and do something with it give me the green apple <laughs> this show um, has gone so sideways all of a sudden anyways <laughs> so have you, have you um, listened to this show <laughs> have i co-hosted on this show for what over 10 years yes <laughs> for those um, of you that are new here that's who i'm speaking to i guess jeff <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, but the other thing to remember is, um, so yeah, so giving ourselves permission to like, you know, intrapsychically um, entertain some of those thoughts. Um, and then, but then also to kind of do them. Um, those are mm-hmm. the two problems that we face. So the other thing, like we kind of talked about before, is sometimes we, we go into situations, whether they are um, like probably like interpsychically and or interpersonally where we don't, the script isn't matching up. <laughs> right. Right. Like we, we're not on the same page or um, there is some like improvising going on and we're really confused uh, because we <laughs> have the script for Hamlet in our hands. Yes. Um, so like some examples of that are what happens when we get rejected um you know like the you know i know that that happened and i have to you know i've count i i've counseled i've coached a lot of people through this you know what other people do has little to do with you and everything to do with them right so if you go up to somebody and you say hey i'm really interested or you send somebody a message and they don't send it back Mm -hmm. that is that is very little to do with you um right but I think that rejection, though, we we make rejection personal because we think it's a judgment. Yeah. And it and in a way it is. But it's not like but it's not meant to be personal. It's it's kind of like, oh, you don't care for this flavor. That's right. that's really a, a different interpretation of it. I just saw it on Twitter today. I thought it was interesting. Someone had posted a couple of months apart, like they put a post and then they commented on the original and they commented again. And I thought it was really interesting to see like a historical context of time where at the very beginning they're like, oh, I went to my local like bakery or coffee shop or something. And I think this guy's really hot, like cute, hot or whatever. And then a couple of months go by and they're like, Um, this person actually asked me what my name was and we had a conversation and like, now I'm all like, could they be? And then a couple months later, they're like, so I decided to give them my number 
and I found out they have a partner. <laughs> Yeah. And and so people were commenting on that and they're like, good for you. Like, way to put yourself out there. And that's OK. Like, I thought it was nice to see people being affirming and being like, you know, at least you did that. And don't feel bad that it took you months to like kind of like have mm -hmm. that moment and then find out that like your gut was right. Like and it's and it's OK, though, like that that's not an option. So another um, another really good example for this is um, so we're talking about kind of going off scripts or people are are uh, you know you have somebody who has Hamlet and the other person who has like uh, Macbeth, um, chasers and chubs right like mm -hmm. what happens when a, a bear goes to um, you know message a uh, like a chub and they're like no. <laughs> You're 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 not what I'm looking for, right? And a lot of people yeah. take that super personally. Yeah, I will own my feelings, and I've had so many times where I look at people's profiles like on Growler, and I'm like I'm just I'm just running a chase, and I'm like, oh. like I've had that feeling of just like, why are you even here then? And Ooh, I judge that. Yeah, that's <laughs> me. I need to check myself on those because I'm like, well, there are there might be people on this app that they that might connect with them and maybe they're throwing a what, you know, they're throwing that net to get what they want. That's not an, that's not on me. That's not something I could control. It's just, that's what they are interested in or looking for at that moment or in, you know, usually consistently, you know, and there's nothing I can really say or do about it. Um, and I have to know that sometimes that's just a, a, a matter of what their tastes are. You know, that's what they're maybe interested in. That's what they're into. And unfortunately, that doesn't, I don't fit in that, that narrative. I don't fit in that script. And right. that's okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so rejection is going to happen. Um, and it is totally okay. Um, also like non-monogamy and like poly, um, relationships, um, like they're going to happen. Right. Um, you know, I think what we talk a lot about this, right. Um, uh, but you know, what happens when, you know, two people, uh, get together and, you know, one is like, yeah, I, I, I like to be consensually non-monogamous, right. Like, you know, my relationship with Jim was that, you know, I hadn't even ever been in a seriously committed relationship before. And, you know, he was like, uh, you know, I've always kind of seen myself as a person, a non-monogamous person. I was like, dude, I like literally, I just got here. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, uh, you know, can, can we just like chill <laughs> for a minute? Um, you know, like, maybe we'll get there, right? But, like, it could have been where I said, you know, that's not something that, that's not on my script. Um, mm -hmm. We're not a good match, right? Mm -hmm. um, that didn't happen. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, that that is something that can happen. Um, I think the other thing, uh, oh, and then also, like, intrapsychically, right? Like, what happens when somebody starts to identify, you know, maybe I'm not, maybe monogamy isn't for me, right? Mm -hmm. um, but they exist in this culture where like monogamy is expected that that has their own cultural sexual script. Um, mm -hmm. It can feel really just, you know, disheartening. Definitely. I, I think I appreciate the people as couples or relationships, however they're defined. Um, that they open up and, and have these conversations with other people. I saw this recently in a chat group and I really appreciated that people were like, Hey, like my partner and I went through a phase where we were like, not sure what we wanted to do. We did some different things. We tried some stuff out. This is where it came out in the end. And the key thing was that we communicated with each other. Right. And I was like, and the thing is like, I, I'm not very active in this particular group and I don't know these people really at all. And I wanted so badly to be like, yay, like, <laughs> like to cheer them on and be like, see, 
Like it's totally, you know, a, a normal thing to like have a have a conversation and like discuss things and constantly be revisiting and reevaluating and going through that stuff. Yeah. Yep. Rethinking Absolutely. is definitely a. Uh, I'm reading this really good book by the way called Rethink. Um, Re- Rethinking by Adam Grant. It's very good. Hmm. And it has me rethinking about how I rethink things. <laughs> So it's a success from what I hear. So far. Um, so also, like, so I say that about the whole non-monogamous being, like, intra-psychically, intra-psychic thing, because also, like, people who identify on, like, the, the ace and arrow spectrum, um, I think, are um, really existing in a world, right, that is that is very amatonormative. Um, and mm-hmm. when you are, are like, I don't, I'm not, like, feeling this <laughs> like, mm-hmm. like oh i just think like how 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 uh, destabilizing that must be um yeah and to also go into um you know interpersonal you know your scripts being an ace and arrow person um you know that is also really important to to know about yourself right mm-hmm. there was a but I forget, it's probably from a British TV show, and it's a video of, of uh, a girl talking to a counselor, and she's admitting that she's asexual. She's, she doesn't know the word, I don't think, at that point, but she's like, I don't, I don't want to have sex. I don't feel like I need to have sex. And the counselor kind of, you know, appropriately and successfully tells her, like, you can still, because she was worried that she would never find love. She would never find relationships. She would never be with someone. And the counselor is kind of telling her, like, you will, um, you're just going to have to, you know, obviously communicate. And it's a different, it'll be a different kind of relationship. It'll be a different kind of love or not a different kind of love, but you know what I mean? Like it, the way we've been taught. Relationship. Yeah. In right. our, that's the word. Yeah. <laughs> Landscape of relationships, folks. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, the thing that I like, we we've been taught from, you know, again, these are cultural that it's all about, it's usually all about sex. And, and when you realize that you are not sexual, um, it becomes this, like, like you said, there's this weird situation in your mind where you don't think you're ever going to find someone because at some point, at some at some time, you're going to they're going to want to have sex with sex, and you don't want that. And I've always felt like I've always not worried, but that is something I'm like, wow, you have to think about that. I'm going to probably find Cody's book, by the way, because I want to read their thoughts on this because that's something that I know has been, yes, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because that is something that I've always been curious about is how that thought process and how do you get out of that cycle um because i we know many people i know several people that are have considered themselves asexual and um having to deal with that in very sexually charged events and spaces Mm -hmm. navigating Mm -hmm. well and i think tangentially uh, or parallel to that is like side, like how we culturally have so much, you know, uh, focus, I guess, mm-hmm. in, in, in appropriately like measured towards like the top verse bottom concepts, because every single one of those involves anal in some aspect. And that's mm-hmm. not a thing for everybody. Right. And statistics show that I think 50% of the time, um, non-anal activities are uh, part of sexual activity, right? So, like, yeah, so 50% of the time people aren't having anal sex. So it's a lot more common than people are giving giving yeah. itself credit for. Like, Jim and I don't, don't fuck. Like, we don't. Like, that's, <laughs> we're both, we're, we both consider ourselves tops. So we, we, that was one thing we kind of established very early on. Like we enjoy each, we enjoy the pleasure of doing mostly oral with each other, mm-hmm. not necessarily having anal sex. Did we try off and on, you know, 
but we realized that neither of us were really into it. So we stopped. And, yeah. and I think that's like key in understanding about like being with somebody and, and having that kind of communication, having a conversation and saying like, this just isn't really of interest to me. And I think yeah. that like societal script has been, well, if you're going to be gay, then like someone yeah. has to give and someone has to receive like, and it's like, no, I mean, there could be giving and receiving an oral. You know that, right? Not right, 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 right. I'm just saying. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> I agree with you. Like, but that, but that's just it, though. Like, you know, in, in our culture of of our generation, when we came up, you know, all the messaging that we had was like all over the place on several different fronts. But that was the one thing is like, well, you know, you either give it up or you give it. Mm-hmm. That's it. Mm-hmm. And and it is kind of ironic because I agree with you. And like, I think it's kind of been that way. For a very long time, it's just no one really regarded that or considered that. Talk about. Yep. I mean, it's really, it's, it's, I think it's really interesting, right? Because, you know, like this, um, the, this distinction of being a side is getting more popular. And the, <laughs> the, the stories that I hear about people who lose their mind when they find out that somebody is a side or, you know, and I'm like, if, like, and I, I also kind of wonder if it has to go back to the, like, you know, what's green versus what's red. Like, if I just told you that, like, hey, I'm just down for oral um, and, like, making out and cuddling, right? If I just led with that, and then if, you know, they were like, yeah, that sounds really good. Are you a top or a bottom? And it's like, you know, you could just say at that time, um, hey, that's not something I'm interested in. Um, cool. But if I lead with no anal, <laughs> right? Like, yeah, that's, we've had that. Like, that's what I have to, to see right now. Yeah. And it's the negatives as opposed to the positives. To. Yeah. Well, and I think it's like it's about the, the words that you choose, like the communication that you make. I've known gay men that have literally said these words, which is where I'm like, Okay, record scratch. When they say, my butthole is exit only. <laughs> and I'm just like, uh, okay, girl. Like, <laughs> like, I'm just like, I don't know why you, like, and it is kind of an older way, I guess, of saying things. I'm just like, what's, all right. Like, like Ed was just saying a moment ago, like, you just say, I'm not into that, or I don't want to do that. Mm-hmm. You don't have to be so emphatic and dramatic about it. <laughs> Like, sex is not a road construction scene. Like, that I have to have, like, explicit signs. Like, come on. And also, I think that, I also think that it goes way deeper than that. Like, because even when I'm talking to to people and negotiating that way, right? Like, I'm like, um, you know, my I like some anal play, but, like, um, not penetration. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and... You know that that seems to be helpful, uh, but you know, again, right? You got can. It's all the way that you. It's all the way you deliver the package. Yeah. Hit the prostate in many ways. It doesn't always have to be. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, I'm very. I'm. I'm. I'm a a, a big proponent on prostate stimulation um yeah gary were you gonna say something (laughs) it's just i was just thinking about how i don't know if it's a resurgence i i feel like the algorithm i'll put it that way has been putting forward a lot of like ass play rimming like eating ass is like a thing and I don't know if I want to say like it's making a comeback or a resurgence or like there's a movement or anything, but it's just interesting to me how I'm like seeing this as like a commonality that like people are, you know, being open about it. Like they're wearing shirts that say it or, you know, they talk openly about it and they're kind of like, you know, like, is anybody want to sit here? Like, I mean, you know, <laughs> gestures at their face or whatever. And I'm just kind of like, okay, like. Yeah, I'm also noticing a lot of like, um, even like tops um, are like, even like 
like porn wise, you're seeing a lot of tops uh, are engaging in rimming, right? As like the 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 receiver, right? They may not want penetration, but you can eat their ass of the cows come home. And I think that's a, a nice indication that they recognize like the pleasure and that it doesn't have to be about, you know, getting wrecked and having a gaping hole. Like, you know, those those cultural <laughs> aren't those like fucked up cultural scripts that we have within our community. It's like, you know, oh, you know, I need someone to blow me out. And I'm like, oh, OK, it's a, that's your thing, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, also, like one of the things with my dissertation that I that I saw, there's this um, uh, theory called the 3 a.m. model. Um, which is about like how we enact our sexual scripts and the role that uh, social the the role that pornography um, plays in that. And I thought it was really interesting because there are a lot of like sexual scripts related to porn where like, you know, anal sex, like penetration is like this like pleasurable, like ecstatic situ situation, right? And then you like you have this other sexual script um, or this other way, when you talk to other people, they're like, oh, yeah, anal sex is really painful, right? Um, and then you have sex. It's painful. So the thing that you're going to enact, you're going to acquire is the one that is closest to you, meaning the, like, relationships that you have. Like, yes, mm -hmm. that was painful. I'm going to – yes, that is what I'm going to use as, as my thing rather than saying – well, it's not painful there. I must be doing something wrong then. Let me let me see about that. I think that's interesting at how you're talking about how like there's this bifurcation. Like there's this kind of like yes, no, like black, white, you know, kind of thing where we're like, no, it's totally gray. Like, like it could be so many different variables as to why it wasn't pleasurable. You know, like anxiety is a thing. And it, it, like you put that into your own body, so you may not have been comfortable, mm -hmm. let alone like psychologically, you know, uh, mentally in a space to to do things. And then again, mm -hmm. you might discover that physically, functionally, things are different. Um, and maybe you're not aware that you know an average size penis is really goddamn big when it goes inside. Um, you know, and we have all these scripts that we've been sold, you know, in terms, especially of like with adult media, you know, that it's got to be, you know, mm -hmm. gargantuan and like, you know, and, and that's like, you know, like the, the pinnacle. And it's like, no, like just, just you know, anyways, totally <laughs> getting into yeah. a sidebar. Um, so, I mean, so we're also talking about, like, the idea of, like, what happens when um, our our sexual script, um, like, is dysfunctional, right? Like, mm. when our, like, our penis isn't hard or um, we come too fast or or there is some sexual pain, um, you know, like, that. that is also something where, like, we don't know what to do. Um, yeah. And, you know, that's a lot of the work that I do. Yeah. Um, but we have all of these sexual scripts that even like our penis is supposed to be hard um, every single time that we have sex. Um, and that's not true. Not <laughs> yeah, It's not always the case. Well, and I, and I think what isn't discussed or talked about, which could be a whole other show someday maybe, is about like, you know, how the body physically reacts is not necessarily a true indication of arousal. Right. Because – we we make that presumption because the script is out there that like an erect penis means satisfaction, right. means arousal, means proper functioning. And, you know, if an individual has, you know, a physical condition, medical condition, you know, maybe they're on, you know, prescription meds or something and it affects things. It doesn't mean that they're not aroused. It doesn't mean that they're not having pleasure or that they won't have an orgasm or ejaculate. Right. Mm hmm. And and I think that, you know, it, it's really sad that, that that's not commonality of understanding. So people make um, presumptions, you know, yeah. and, you know, kind of right. have judgments about like, you know, oh, like I must not be that great of a lover or whatever. Yeah. And it's like it has nothing to do with it, maybe. Yeah, I mean, you're you are literally looking at their script um, and you're creating your own minds, your own experience about 
your own story about what's going on. Yeah. Um, a, oh, what, Damon? Well, I'm just remembering an episode of Law and Order SVU where it was um, it was a man um, being sexually assaulted by a woman, and there was this whole his wife was having this whole like argument with him that he couldn't have possibly um, done the deed because he had to have some sexual arousal to in order to like do you know do it like because yeah yeah and it was very much this you know the svu detectives were kind of like saying like you know it doesn't always happen that way it does you you, it's a that it's a body reaction it's a physical reaction it's something that you may not be able to control or you may in the this the dysfunction side of this kind of thing you it's sometimes you you're not able to do it but you know you can't like your body will respond mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Can't um, to say. and now we're talking about trauma right so like uh you know trauma uh when when we have trauma when we experience trauma we have when we have a history of trauma um, and also mental health, right? Like that also can overlay a different kind of um, sexual script uh, that is um, important for us to be aware of. Um, and, you know, sometimes we're having sex and, you know, we're thinking we're reading Hamlet and then all of a sudden um, Macbeth shows up. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, we're like, whoa. Right. This isn't. This isn't. Yeah. This wasn't part of my, of my of the show. Here. Yeah. Um, like, so, what are you doing here? This isn't. This isn't your show. Like, <laughs> this isn't your story. <laughs> oh, now Mercutio is here. <laughs> God damn. Um. So yeah, it, it's. Uh, that's another thing to be aware of. Um. So. Um, to kind of wrap all this up, right? Um, especially with the, you know, what happens when uh, when we go off script or whatever. Um, it's really important, um, kind of like with the good rules of improv, uh, that instead of, you know, kind of saying, you know, oh, no, right? Say yes and, right? Um, that it isn't, sometimes everything isn't going to go um According to the script, we have to improvise. Um, we have to accommodate, right? We have to, uh, or we get to. We don't have to do anything, but we mm-hmm. we get to um, kind of go with the flow. Well, and I was just going to say, Ed, I think it's important that people understand when we're saying yes and, that doesn't mean you're agreeing, you're uh, accepting, like you are recognizing but it doesn't mean that you're acquiescing that you're giving mm-hmm. in does that make sense mm-hmm. yeah. like so like because I, I think people would be like con- thinking or i don't want them to have the takeaway that like you say yes and yes is an agreement it's like no yes is a recognition mm-hmm. it's kind of like this is going to be a strange analogy probably it's like if dame and i were going to go out to dinner together and i asked him what he wanted and he's like well i'm really in the mood for seafood even and then but i don't care for seafood like instead of saying no i would say okay i hear you how about we try a place that meets your needs but also like meets my needs you know what i mean which yeah. means yeah we're probably not going to red lobster um but <laughs> well, lobster has steak i think uh, yeah but, yeah Ooh, Ooh, cheddar bay biscuits was... anyways <laughs> and now we're hungry uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah I get, I... Uh, um, no, I was just going to say, uh, no, yeah, very much that, that, um, you know, uh, we also have to be willing to, um, yeah, to like change the script a little bit. Right. But right. also to know your boundaries, right? Like where, what are some of your, your areas that you're not willing to go? Um, because, you know, like, Sex isn't always going to go, you know, 100% the same way every single time. And a lot of times that's not helpful. Um, So, 
uh, what is it? Variety is the spice of life. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's another um, like mnemonic device, I guess, um, that I like <laughs> to use um, when it comes to uh, like the experience of acceptance, kind of accepting your own sexual script, um, somebody else's sexual script, um, and the experience that like, oh, my sexual script isn't going the way that I that it normally does is to kind of acknowledge what's happening, um, allow mm-hmm. it to happen. Um, accommodate it, right? Like, you know, what we were talking about with the restaurant thing. Um, yeah. And that appreciate it, right? Like, you know, at the end of the day, we are, the goal is to have a good time um, yeah. and to to enjoy ourselves, right? So like, appreciate the fact that like, hey, you know what? Like my script isn't kind of going the way that I, I thought it was going to, but like, I'm still here having a good time. Right. Like the the restaurant analogy is a perfect one of those. It's a good example because Gary was like, I don't like seafood, but we're going to go to a place that maybe has both and we can both enjoy the meal. And then we go and it's a really fantastic meal and um, really enjoying that meal and that conversation and whatever that goes along with it. All the wonderful, you know, compliments to the chef, as it were, as we, you know, (laughs) eat this meal and we're like, oh, this is really tasty. And oh, and we're glad we're, and at the end of the day, it'd be like, Gary, thank you for um, making this recommendation and kind of moving on from there. Like maybe next time we'll go to my place or, you know, whatever, like go to a different place. But Right. I think that um, this kind of goes back to like talking earlier about like consent. Um, hence, we have the whole shirt line, right? The The idea is you have that 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 conversation. I think one of the most like one of the experiences I look the most fondly back on is the one where someone said to me like we had already agreed that we were interested in each other and we were hooking up, but before anything happened when we were in person because this started uh, digitally or virtually, when we were in person they said I need to let you know something first because they were concerned about something about their, their physicalness and, and medical situation. And I've never forgotten it because I thought it was the most like authentic, like a moment to have with another person. And I could kind of tell that they were nervous to have this conversation, but I respected them so much because they were like, you need to know this. And like, because I don't want this to get awkward or uncomfortable if we don't talk about it now and then we wait till later or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay. Like, and, and I think like fondly back on that because I'm like, that's really what it should be like probably all the time. Right. But we, but we have to get into that habit. We have to be willing to do that and have those conversations. And Mm -hmm. we have, you know, we have to edit the script. There you go. Yeah. Gotta edit. Mm-hmm. Um, and now I have a vision of of Damon with a red pen in his hand. But anyways, <laughs> it's not red, but <laughs> I have notes. Anyways, <laughs> and I have notes. <laughs> that was great, but <laughs> oh. Yeah. You tried this way. Right. Instead of saying, oh, baby, oh, baby, oh, could you try baby, oh, baby, oh, baby? (laughs) Yeah, I think that's going to hit for me differently. (laughs) (laughs) The syncopation is going to turn me on. There you go. (laughs) I'm sorry. Can you be Mm. a little louder? Thank you. I think I've told this story of the podcast before, but I need to learn to project. I'm having this flashback memory to this one time at at said job I mentioned earlier where this guy was like a broken record. I think I've told you guys this, right? And he's like this dog daddy and he keeps saying like the same three things over and over and over again. Like that's the only thing he says. Wait. (laughs) We've seen those guys in porn. Well, that was just it. It Like it's like it was it was like real life porn. He was like, oh, yeah, suck that dick. 
And like, and then it just started over again. And that's all he said for like an hour. Yep. <laughs> and everybody was like, all right, I gotta go. Like, <laughs> <laughs> just like, this is not happening. Like, I don't know what, I don't know what's happening. Over I, here, but, uh, I, I am out of this scene. I'm out of this moment. <laughs> You know, the best, some of the best scenes come from improvisation. Like, like wake me up when he's done. <laughs> I mean, I think some people took it on as a challenge to be like, well, if I get him to nut, he'll shut up or like he'll leave or he'll go away or something. I think that was like some people's like perspective. And I was just like, oh, okay. Maybe we find a counter and see how many times he says it. But... <laughs> I mean, there's a part of me. It's like, what are you, an NPC? Good lord! Like, this is just, <laughs> this is just not happening. Yeah. Quite literally, yes. Uh, um, yeah. <sighs> well, to wrap to wrap that all, I think what we're kind of talking about is that, like, communication, as usual, is the key when we're dealing with um, our sexual scripts, other people's sexual scripts. Um, and, you know, uh, especially when it comes to your boundaries. Right. Agreed. Agreed. All right. And have some variety in what you're saying during sex. <laughs> Don't stick to the script. <laughs> Improvise. Be present. <laughs> Compliment is their this... hair or something. Be ready for rewrites. <laughs> yeah. Is this a... Is this... Acting class or a sexual conversation? Could be right. both. I'm really like, uh, I'm noticing that I'm really liking that you're doing that thing with your tongue. Do more of that. that. Can we keep? Can Did you take can that at about ten percent? <laughs> can you take? I need a crescendo. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. <sighs> uh huh. Can you decrescendo that? Um, yeah. uh, your tongue there. It's. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. that's very aggressive. Yeah, look, tone that I, down. I like your vocalizations. However, I would like you to put more feeling into it. <laughs> or just shut the fuck up. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. Anyways, I have thoughts, but I'm saving it for post show. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, gentlemen. Once more with feeling. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> gentlemen, this is the end. Wow. Aww. How do you con uh, contact Cubs out loud? <laughs> Sorry. Okay, we can stop. <laughs> Can we? And can we cut? <laughs> Strike that. Uh, anyways, play always contact us. Pop over to our website, comesoutloud.com. You can leave a comment on the blog. You can also shoot us an email at comesoutloud at gmail.com. Leave us a voicemail at 361-COL-TALK. That's 361-265-8255. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube at Cubs Out Loud on the appropriate place of the URL. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, you can also join our Entourage chat on Telegram at bit.ly slash telegram dash col. If you'd like to see when we're planning on recording these shows, you can check it out at our Google Calendar at bit.ly slash calendar dash col. See a theme here? You can get various accoutrements such as a consent is my foreplay shirt and many other things which are back on the store because I finally realized there's a repost button. Uh, you can also have some of those designs, especially our new ones, such as flexibility for accessibility. Please, you have to be logged in and have your settings set to, to allow for the rated R stuff, uh, are uh, available. Yeah, we're designed by Smashy. You can find more of his work at tpublic.com slash user slash Smashy the Bear. You can also become a patron at patreon.com slash Cubs Out Loud or send us a donation at paypal.me slash Cubs Out Loud. Please uh, rate us, review us, uh, give us up on the algorithms of all the, your social podcasting platforms such as 
Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify, and Amazon, and Audible. I think we're on there, too. You can find me anywhere on the internet as Box, that Box, Poppy Box, uh, Box, something or other. Damon. If you wish to get in touch with me, you can find me as Theater Cub 79. That's T-H-E-A-T-R-E-C-U-B 79 on most very related sites are on Facebook. Or you can find me as Pup underscore Ember on Twitter. The Twitter is definitely not safe for work. Gary? If you would like to get in touch with me, you can pretty much find me anywhere online as GareBear73. Ed, as yes. usual, as a recurring uh, favorite uh, sex therapist guest, where can folks find you? Well, you can find me on Facebook as um, Edward AC. Um, you can find me on uh, Instagram at uh, dr.unicub underscore sexbrainwizard. Um, and then you can also find me on the tweet um, at uh, dr. period uh, uncub after dark, um, and that one's NSFW. Um, so, like, no clients or people that I like. <laughs> what we can't am related to. Oh. And <laughs> with that, and see. Good night, everybody. Have a good one, y'all.